Okay, so hello everybody. I think we are looking forward to a wonderful presentation tonight. And I think uh, we have all sorts of reasons to be absolutely grateful to Professor Fabio Masace uh, giving us uh, some insights about basically the cost of certainty uh, or security, if you want. Cost of certainty or a relative elimination of challenges. Uh, so I think what we are looking forward to is something that for many of us is a completely new mindset because in order to be able to develop models about security and cost of security and especially about policy implications, we have to combine two very different sort of considerations. One is about the benefits of, of uh, certainty or security on the one side. And the second is the probability of threats or elements of randomness. And basically, what does it imply for the costs and what kind of policy would be best to uh, cover these costs, how, how the costs should be uh, distributed among the, among the parties. Uh, if you look at Professor Fabio Masacci's uh, Vita, I think it's extremely impressive. First, it's very, very multidisciplinary because studying both engineering computer engineering and international relations. I think it's, uh, it's kind of a somewhat unusual combination uh, uh, in itself. Uh, he also affiliated to multiple universities at this point in time to this beautiful uh, city in Northern, it Northern Italy, which is Trento. Uh, uh, I think I have really very fond memories of this place. It's uh, as a wonderful uh, boutique university great cathedral and absolutely unbelievable surroundings. Uh, but he also uh, uh, has a chair uh, in Amsterdam, which is a, a fairly liberal city, but even more liberal than that, he's at the Free University or the Freie Universität von Amsterdam, <laughs> as opposed to the Universität von Amsterdam, which is uh, arguably less free, or at least uh, uh, less affiliated <laughs> to, the, uh, to the church. Uh, so I think uh, he also kind of a social entrepreneur, worked for all over the place in Rome and Cambridge and Toulouse, Koblenz, Louvain. So it's a French part of the University of Leuven, I would be, I presume. Uh, and Ray and Oslo. So I think, of course, Durham is also in, in this list of places. And I think he, he is one of the very few people who know about computer security or the security of computer systems from both sides. Um, because he's willing to talk to, uh, to the hackers uh, and contribute to the, the, their conferences, what I think uh, is extremely insightful. So the I think uh, uh, we will get really a, a unique perspective uh, on the cost of security and where the cost apparently comes from. Uh, I think uh, from now on, he and his presentation should talk to for itself. So uh, giving just a, a little bit of uh, information about whether we should trust him or not, I think it's enough. Quite clearly we should. Uh, now, what we should tr trust in is remains to be heard. So I'm very much looking forward to it. And thank you very much for giving us this presentation. Uh, I think we would be able to thank you again after listening to it, but just in advance, I think all the accolades are due.
Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, this will be a slightly different presentation that you have used to most of the cases, and that's why I wanted to do it live. So what I'll suggest, if you look on the top of my screen, uh, you will see that there is something like a website, www.menti.com, yeah. and the code, which is I will put also into the chat, so you can actually copy and paste. And uh, this will allow you to interact with the presentation. And uh, 33, 38, eight. In fact, the presentation and provide you a, actually give you a, a way to put question directly appearing on the presentation. That's a lot, of course, a lot of a risk of this. You could actually type uh, <laughs> unpolite question, but that's fine. I like risk. And it also give you a little bit, I'll ask you some question and there will be a possibility for everybody also to see the answer of the question. So let me actually start with the, with the first question. So I would like to, to know a little bit of my audience. So whether you can answer whether you are from, my audience is more, more from social science, natural science, computer science, engineering, so that, that I will try to target my example also a little bit on my audience. And okay, so we have a. Uh, I'm probably I should answer myself that I <laughs> for computer science and engineering. And we see there's a preponderance of the social science and the natural science among the audience. So we, among at least the one that answered. And uh, natural science, I mean, it's also ge geography, physics, uh, or I don't know whether we should mathematics should be in the natural science or in CS and engineering, but uh, let's assume it's in the uh, natural science for the moment. So uh, let me move forward to what is the problem that we're going to assess. So I think here there should be a way to make this smaller. Yes. Uh, so one of the typical problems that we are discussing with interconnected society is a very well defined problem. On one side, we have firms, they're individuals, uh, they're more or less selfish. And the question is whether they will invest in protection against the risk. And the question becomes extremely relevant when the magnitude depends on the action of, of others. The magnitude of the risk depends on what other people do. Not only on what yourself do, but also on what other people do, right? One example could be passive smoking, but other examples are, for instance, theft, right? Uh, if you live in an area which have a lot of camera in which a lot of people do neighborhood watch, then depending on what the others do, then of course, it's gonna be the risk for you will be much lower. So you may decide that up at the end of the day, you don't need to invest in uh, more security because this, your neighbor already is doing the, the job of the police uh, of the neighbors. And this has been well studied by a very famous paper in the Journal of Risk and Uncertainty in 2003 by Elon Kuhnreuter. The question that you want to ask in this talk uh, and I want to explore with you and discuss at a certain point, is a question that relates to, for instance, airports, right? The typical example we are all aware of is baggage security. Why is it an example of interdependence? Well, of course, if you don't screen the parting passengers, what's going to happen? Well, they can smuggle all kinds of things, right? Explosives, particularly bad weapons, so this creates for us a problem. Why? Because the beneficiary is the arriving airport. It's the country where the passengers are arriving, right? Or anyhow, if you think in terms of, uh, for instance, hijacking the plane, which has been something of a recent, um, let's say news, no, not so recent, but say 10 years ago, but still recent for the perspective of, the perspective of uh, airports uh, security. 
is something you don't like, right? However, unfortunately, the cost is paid by the departing airport. It, it is the departing airport that have to set up a screening procedure. It is the departing airport that has to buy security screener as a, as a, what is a device as, as a staff. The departing airport is just thank you for all this, right? In some cases, the, the departing airport, the arriving airport do not trust the arrival airport to be secure. So this is a typical example that we see, especially in very small airports that they arrive from uh, not so, let's say, not, not, well, let me say not so, it's probably a bit of two liberal places, right? So each time I arrive from the airport from Amsterdam, there are always uh, dogs to, to sniff the, the baggages. Because you know, the Netherlands is a different policy for with respect to the drugs for personal use, right? So, so you always have all these dogs. And when I come from different kinds of airport or planes in a region, I don't have that many dogs around. In this case, it's an example of an additional cost that is carried by the departing, that the arrival airport, because they don't really trust the departing airport to, to, to enforce it. And the same things you can see, for instance, when you go from Ecuador to Colombia, and then from Colombia to Europe, would remain on the same argument, right? In Ecuador, coca, coca leaves are allowed. You can go in a supermarket and buy tea bags, but you know, like twinnings, right? A tea bag of coca leaves that you can use for your uh, afternoon tea. They're very British, except that the, the tea is slightly different. Uh, but not in Colombia. And therefore, when the plane arrives, all the baggage gets screened again for the, tea, for the wrong type of tea bags. And they are going to screen because they don't want to have problems when the passenger then goes to London or Amsterdam or Frankfurt, where these things are not allowed. And, but again, this is a cost that is put on the Colombian airport because they do not trust the Ecuadorian airport to actually enforce it. At the same time, if the departing airport will enforce it, that will actually make it, they will pay the cost of this with the screener and so on, and then the, the Colombian airport will not have anything to pay for. So this is a typical example of interdependence. And in computing, this process is even more extreme. So let me start to, to see the, the example of airports a little bit more in detail to giving you some data, actually showing you some data. So this is a, a, a heat map showing the connection of the 200 most popular airports in, Italy, in, in Europe, sorry. Uh, on one, so the, you read it by rows and columns, right? So you start from an airport and you arrive at another airport. So on, on one side, right, so you line 100, you have all the airports that arrive. And you see here, I, I hope you can see my mouse, hopefully. Uh, you see that there's very, very sparse, right? 100 airports, there's very, very few connections. And then we go to a cluster in which the heat start going up, in which we have ex an extremely a high number of connections. Uh, you see the most top most 20 airport are extremely hot in terms of flights that arrive and depart from there. And the F airports, uh, like, you know, 200, well, you have very, very little airports that, that goes there and fly there as and so on in terms of flights connection. So you see, this is a typical graph of interdependence, right? Because when you think of theory of interdependence, we always have formal models that do not really take into account the reality on the ground. And reality of the ground is never well distributed. It's never a random graph. It's never a full, fully connected graph. 
is always a graph like this, right? You have some airports, some of these red dots you see are airports that receive a lot of connections. And yet it seems not in the area. Right? You see, this, these are what are called feeder airports. Uh, just to show you some data. Right? On, on one year, you see three examples. They're connected by the same airline, by the same airlines. So on one side, you have Munich in Germany, but it's one of the largest. European airport, like seventh European airport, and 27th airport World War. And you go there with that, you know, Alitalia, Lufthansa, British Airways, and then you have second step. And you look at the numbers of the passengers per year, you see that's the order of magnitude down, right? You have Verona. And Verona is a, what is called a feeder airport, right? So it feeds the, the hubs. It feeds Lufthansa to Munich, Air Italia to Rome, Air France to Paris, uh, Amsterdam. There is very not. There are direct flights from Verona, but not so many to some touristic region. Okay, Ancona is in a very nice place near Rimini, where there's a uh, the beaches in the Adriatic seas are, and you see this even less flights. Right, there's a Lufthansa, the National Carrier Italia, and low cost airlines. And you see, we, we are again in order of magnitude down. <clears throat> so, Verona, as you see, is 200 flights per day, Ancona is 20. The passages per day change a, a lot as well, right? So, you see, here we really see different numbers. And so why are you talking of these numbers? Why are these numbers relevant to talk about security? Because there are a lot of other things that are happening in the airport domain that are relevant from our perspective. They're also relevant for some of the projects that, that we're doing here. So what are the new things that are happening? The first one there are, because we have a problem of capacity, there are a number of very large programs by the US, in, uh, uh, by the European Union, in China, uh, Singapore, to put more automation, more and more automation in managing airports, more and more automation managing flights, because we want the skies more packed. This is seems sort of ridiculous now, because there are not that many flights anymore. And uh, as Laszlo was saying, I actually tried to commute from uh, Trento to Amsterdam, which is an interesting in time of coronavirus. And from time to time, they cancel my flights. But the, the interesting thing is that they, 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 the idea of these programs that give more automation is to pack more flights into the skies. More flights, this means shorter distance between the flights. Uh, and this more automation, of course, means that more of the activities that till now uh, were doing, done by humans, like for instance, scheduling the landing of an airport, uh, they will should be done by computer. So we're moving some decision-making from the human to a decision-making of the computer. This means also sharing the data. The next thing, there's another trend that's happening, is that we are moving towards what is called the IT and OT. OT stands for Operational Technology Integration. So we are moving from a world in which companies have their own separate network, in which they did their own business. So they have a separate network that is used to communicate to, I don't know, a sensor on an airfield. They had a separate network to control um, power plants. Okay, so that was something that, for instance, uh, National Grid, uh, NL in Italy will do. So they were all moving in a, towards an integration of integrating the IT, the traditional IT, which was so far only destined for business, towards uh, network integration with operational network that's used actually to control devices, for instance, to control radars, to talk to planes, and so on. And 
this shift is also moved towards, I will call a tectonic shift. We have not yet realized this. Um, the impact of this uh, is the shift to a public communication infrastructure. So as of, I don't know, 20 years ago, there will be a special line for the air traffic control center to talk to another air traffic control center. Uh, it's no longer that way. They are using the normal IT infrastructure offered by telecom providers, which has become private companies. And is, well, if this was a, a public communication infrastructure. So in a sense, I don't know if you should be worried or not, probably you should. Uh, on the same cable that used to stream your Netflix and used to stream my conversation with you, probably there is also the eye level link that goes the conversation from the Verona airport and the Munich airport. Whether this plane should land or not, they, they walk on the same fiber. And if something goes down, then, well, okay, it goes down for your Netflix video, as well as for the connection on the, your plane and air traffic controller. This shift is happening more and more. And in several cases, of course, you have redundancy, but you don't know exactly uh, whether this redundancy is real or only on paper. Because sometimes the private company, they lease each other the lines. So you think you have two contracts to different companies to ensure redundancy. But in reality, company one outsource the work to company two. And therefore, you actually only have a contract with company two, even though you have two contracts. And finally, there's a big deal of privatization. So airports and airlines are supposed to be private firms drive a profit, or they should at least make profit. Of course, we're now talking in a different situation, but assuming that the pandemic should stop, they're gonna back, go back after the bailout of most of the <laughs> airlines and also most of the airports. Okay, so these are actually good things, right? Well, not really, because you can have more cybersecurity instincts. Uh, so you can have actually people try to talk to planes, hijacking the communication of the planes. And in, in one case, for instance, there was one communication, uh, the communication between a, uh, an airport and the an airplane in, in, uh, in Turkey, for instance, the communication was completely hijacked and the plane was actually talking to some alligate air traffic controllers and the the plane was, was sort of to be directed in a different direction, it was essentially a remote hijacking, except that the pilot was not convinced of this because he knew, he's actually told, you know, there should be only women in that air traffic control center. How come I'm talking to a man and decided not to follow the instruction and go is walk to a different frequency? And then actually, so I avoided to being hijacked. But actually, from the perspective of the radio link and the communication, everything works smoothly and the things was actually hijacked. And the things may happen already if you start thinking of sharing the data. Uh, similar things may happen, right? And we go to the next level of the passage of things that happened, which was called the remote and virtual tower. And the basic idea is that in the small airports, in small and medium airports, we, we don't have enough planes to justify an extremely costly deployment of a tower. And the things that cost a lot in the tower is actually the air traffic controller, the guy, the human, because they need to be trained, but they can only work for 45 minutes. And, and then I have to make a break. And um, I, I, if after I've seen a screen in an air traffic control center, I believe that 45 minutes is a bit of a stretch. I probably should work less. At least I will need to work less <laughs> than 45, 30 minute, uh, 45 minutes in a row. And they need to know a lot of things about planning that, for instance, uh, 
if you have two planes coming one against the other, the solution is never to make one's verb right or left, but actually make one going up and the other going down. Uh, and, and so on. So you need to have a lot of know-how that's difficult to have. So the idea is that, okay, we're gonna remove completely the air traffic controller in the virtual towers, and we're gonna replace with remotely piloted virtual towers. Now you can imagine this, we're gonna create a lot of interesting security problems. So for instance, what about if I replace, in a, like in the movies, right? There still be the video feed from the, um, uh, from the tarmac with the bogus video feed. I can have airport landing there, airplane landing there, smuggling drugs without any difficulties, right? Or if I, if I have a problem and I want to hijack a plane or I want to forbid a plane to land, I can turn, just turn off on the denial of service against the remote tower, right? So because in this case, the, the, the people is no longer, they can no longer see who is landing on the plane, can no longer see the tarmac. They're gonna be replaced completely by a virtual view and over the window view that's completely virtual, that's replaced by sensors and cameras and so on. And the larger airports will be in charge of this remote and virtual towers. So this is a trend that's coming more and more. So for instance, uh, the first known deployment was in Sweden at the Hideo Airport. Fort Collins, Loveland Municipal Airport in the US, and Bodo in Norway, and 50 more at the end of 2022 in Norway alone. So this is a trend that's happening. In the, of course, as you can imagine, this will create more and more uh, issue of cybersecurity because the things will be connected, right? And then the question that, that will, will happen is, who should pay for security? And then I will ask to ask the audience to make this a little bit interactive. Who, in your opinion, should actually pay, right? You can actually rank this in, uh, from, uh, from Menti. So you can actually try to rank which, in your opinion, should pay. So for instance, should passengers pay? So national government pay, should local government pay, the one where the airport is actually located, or should just the airport run, or whether the airlines should do it. So let me see if uh, somebody can want to try to run this. So we see that, of course, we see one, the, the, the opinion of one, as one person now says, okay, that's the, I see also airlines coming up. <laughs> that's the, the idea of airport as a business is a sort of uh, strong point because that's what we believe that the airport's a business and uh, national government, of course, are also one we're, we're very strong point here. Uh, passengers' fees, I see they're always very at the bottom when, when I run this. Uh, <laughs> Are you surprised? <laughs> well, but you know, you will be surprised when I tell you something else. Uh, you can also ask questions if you want, but you will also feel free to unmute yourself and uh, that's sir. Uh, because then there will be a second question, because that, this is what you think who should pay. But the, the question is who is actually paying for it in real life? Right? Because of course here we have two models. One is of course the national government. This is a clear centralized model. And the airport is a business instead as a more decentralized model, right? So if you want passengers fee, local government, they're all a decentralized model. Now I go to the second question. Who actually does run and pay for security? I gave you four examples. So one is US, two in the US and Europe, one in uh, two in, uh, in Asia. So one is US, USA, the other is France, China, and South Korea. And then you can decide whether you want to, who is actually pay for security. So who will provide security? Is it centralized? And who is funding 
by it, right? Like the centralized model is the government that foot the bill at the end of the day, or do they have a mix of the centralized model? Because they will be surprised, I think you'll be surprised uh, and, uh, on the expectation that we have on the countries. So let me, let me try to see if you want to try and test yourself. <clears throat> so the more the, the extreme side is the, the, the centralized government is here. I think you should be able to see, uh, okay, yes, here. So you see the more you go to the center, the more you're centralized, the more you go to the top, uh, you are decentralized, right? So the firms runs the show and the, the centralized, the government run the show. And we see here some expectation, of course, of the China, I think it was an easy guess, right? Uh, <laughs> but you'll be surprised. Uh, uh, but I think the others is sort of a different uh, feedback in particular, right? You know, South Korea or France, they seem sort of in the middle, right? As well as the US with the uh, sort of middle ground of the different uh, setup. Ah, okay, so we have somebody else voting. Let's wait for one. Uh, I think we have seven people voting and then uh, let's see. Okay, so as you can see here, there's gonna be a big difference if you have the variance of the people. So some people thought that uh, you see from the US were extremely decentralized, right? Another people thought that the US was extremely centralized. While for China, I think there was a broad agreement is mostly decentralized. And France is also, you see, it is pretty much different. So let me, let me go for you, which will give you an idea of the security of structural provision. And you see, for instance, the UK is more in the decentralized model. Um, uh, but the State security taxes, for instance, are US, Italy, and China, and the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is more, but if you look at large countries, the decentralized model is more like France, where also security is a local provision, it's not provisioned by the state, whereas the state is actually a centralized model. You actually, is the TSA, the Transport Security Authority, which is run globally, that provides security across uh, the different airports. What is that is not really true for, for other countries, like as I said, France, South Korea, as well as a sort of a hybrid of a decentralized model. So in this talk, I will now discuss a little bit of more of a model of mathematical model of interaction. Um, so on one side, we have target airports, right? So we understand now the scenario, we have target airports. They may be strategic because they are actually firm, right? They have become individual firm. They have to invest some of the money themselves. And we assume that the attacks are purely reactive. They see an opportunity, they go ju jumping. They don't, are not really strategic in this, but they're not optimizing thing, which sort of correspond also to the reality as, as an example. And particularly if you're thinking in terms of cybersecurity attacks, right? Because we see that in the field, you have people that can be very quickly a switch side. They can be a hacker a, hunted by the FBI and uh, two years later, they are an FBI consultant and vice versa. There's no sting, uh, stigma. Uh, for being an hacker, if you work for law enforcement and vice versa, you can you have the skill, you can switch from one to the other. Uh, also because the techniques are the same, right? So the techniques that you need, to, the skill you need to learn are the same. This is not normally true for, I don't know, house burglaries. Right, so if you need to, to break into a house, that's not normally the same set of skill to apprehend the thief, right? There are different set of skills, but defending and attacking computer system, they're pretty much the same set of skills. Uh, so we make some assumptions that of course, the probability of successful attack depends on the security investments, but we have also an idea that it will depend on the number of attackers. Of course, the more the merrier. And the investments come from two different sources. 
the investment directly from the own airports and the investment for the connected airports, right? So, so the investment of the people from which we fly from, Ooh, no, sorry, we fly from. And of course, so we have a social planner as in the classical uh, economics uh, papers that we will assume the social planning will optimize for some of and since we need to have a certain formula, that's it. So I'm not going to spend the formula with that. Just to mention that is made by two components. On one side, we have a base component that depends on the number of attacker either. So how many attackers are against you? And on the security expenditure, which is a classical concave uh, function, exponential decay function, in which there are the your own expenditure of the uh, I airport and the, the inclusion of the other airports. And then we have the classical optimizing function. I'm not gonna spend much time about it. Uh, we simply have the loss times the probability of a successful attack plus the expenditure. You want to balance these two things. Policymaker is actually worried about all the airports. We may say that there might be a, a weight in front of each of them, because probably Heathrow is not as important as, I don't know, Glasgow. Maybe as Aberdeen is okay because you fly from there to, to the oil platform, but what about other remote islands in, Scot islands in Scotland, right? But in theory, if you talk to a, a legislator, they always say they're all equally important. Anyhow, the mathematical results do not change if we factor weights into, uh, into effect. Probably it's get man just magnified. And then we assume that the attackers are, are, are um, reactive. So they're just determined by, uh, by a result. They're going to attack some targets and they're going to make a reward. Reward is not necessarily a monetary utility, right? It's in hotels, which could be kudos on a website, it could be number of fatalities money if you are a organized criminal, but that's so, so they, they don't necessarily measure things in money. They will have a certain costs and it will be multiplied by the number of overall attackers and they, they should balance, right? The overall, in the first camp, first server, it's the first attack to compromise the system, of course, uh, will take it down, but then the vulnerability will be fixed and then this will no longer be possible. This is a feature of security that's not there in the different, um, in other domains, right? Uh, you can be kidnapped more than once, for instance. Your house can be broken into more than once. But if you have a vulnerability, you hack it, you're discovered, people will fix the vulnerability. So next time you have to fix a different vulnerability. So this means that the cost start from scratch again. This is not typical of other, other words. So let me now ask a question, right? Suppose there is no interdependence. We, we're gonna get to the close of the talk uh, to just leave 10 minutes for question. So if there is no interdependence, what do you think should happen in the model that I've just described? So should the, will the regulator always mandate more security expenditure? Or maybe there's no difference. Right. The optimal cost, according to the regulator, will be the same as the optical cost on the unregulator. All this depends on the attacker's parameters. More attackers streaming in means that the regulator will put more money or, or so on. So what is your opinion here? And uh, what do you think will be the, the question, right? So there's not going to be any difference between the two. We have no interdependence, right? So we assume that all airports are on their own. We don't bother about their security connections. I see there is a consensus, it's that's an emerging a consensus that the regulator is equal to the unregulated version. And uh, let me see if somebody else wants to have a try. Otherwise, we move to the, to the next uh, questions. So this is actually true. And I'm gonna go to the next question. So what happens if we have unregulated target within interdependence? We can actually show 
that the X with two star, I don't know if you've seen my mouse, so I'll just describe it, which is the unregulated target interdependence, will actually spend more, less than the regulate, unregulated target interdependence. That's the X with the star only. What has happened? Basically, let me go to the, the English version. <clears throat> The interdependent but unregulated targets will spend less than unregulated targets, but the number of attackers will stay the same. So that's what the mathematical model capture, and this actually robust to different formulation or slightly different formulation of the models. Why this happened? Because basically it's a tragedy of the commons. Right? Target reduce loss, but rather choose to keep the risk. Right? Because it says, well, you know, we want to have a certain level of risk. Oh, it looks good. We can spend less money. The risk will be the same. And we can uh, essentially <coughs> use, instead of our own money, the money that our friends will put into the picture. Right? This is as well, well understood in the social sciences as the theory of risk homeostasis, as published in the first paper, I think, was in 1982. There's a more recent paper now. So basically, if people think there's a right level of risk for them, they will take more or less risky bets uh, the, just to keep the risk equal. So the, the less you feel the risk is there because your friends are, con your friends, uh, air connected airport friends are contributing to security, the less you can expand yourself. And this is an example, like for instance, why they don't have uh, sniffing dogs when the plane for, from Paris arrived in Verona, but they have a sniffing dogs from the, when the planes arrive from Amsterdam. Uh, if we go to the regulated target with interdependence, we have an even worse formula. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, but I would only like to, to point you to some things. So the problem, when you have the regulator, the regulator will actually push people to improve their security with interdependence because he can make, distribute the expenditure so that the things will be different. So the security will be, the, then the uh, regulated case will be smaller. Oh, this number is larger than one. And the number of attacker was largely uh, smaller than one, uh, smaller than the unregulated case. The interesting case is that the expenditure by regulated target it's on one side smaller, this one plus delta minus one. Remember, the delta is the matrix that gives us the connection. I'll come back to this, why you see here the delta occurs everywhere in the equations. And then this is the X star, is the unregulated expenditure without interconnection. And this is minus something, but this minus something is a formula that is smaller than one because it's a probability basically. So this is positive. So on one side, we have interconnection make you think going down. But on the other side, interconnection can make also things going up, right? Because it makes this smaller and smaller. So what's this effect? How can we say this in, in English? Okay, the attack probability diminishes. But the individual expenditures may go up and down. And why that? Because the regulator may decide that because there is interconnection and because the airports are not, are differently interconnected, remember that we have here Delta, which is the connection matrix between the different airports, different interconnected, it may be that things goes up and down depending on the interconnection. The regulator may be sensible in deciding the optimal amount to how interconnected or how less interconnected you are. So it depends essentially on the efficiency of some player, that's the alpha that we have in the picture. The more efficient you are, the more you may have to, the less you may have to spend. And this efficiency effect is only among the efficient airport. The less the efficient airport will not benefit from it. Let's see an example here, right? Let's go back to our question, how to charge security. So now the present setup across Europe and the US is a flat tax. 
Every passenger has to pay between five or seven euros. You can check your latest um, uh, uh, travel tickets and you will find out. It's something like five, seven, three, seven, a tax to all airports, security charge. Now, this is now, right? Now we increase interdependence. We're gonna have small airports that are gonna be remotely interconnected so that they, their air traffic control tower is remotely maintained. While big airport will still have their own traffic control, air traffic control tower. So they will gonna be less, of course, interdependent. They are already interdependent for what regards to flights, but their interdependence will not increase because they have additional technology being developed. But of course, the question is, if you think of Europe, we have 20 mega airports and something like 400 small and medium airports. So some of them will, have, will see an increase in inter interdependence and some of them will stay as they are. They're already a lot interdependent, but will stay as they are. Who will benefit from it? So let me ask you this question. So we give a flat tax to everybody. This is the setup. It's very simple to manage. Every passenger is five euros. So now we're going to tell the some airport we're going to be more interdependent. So who do you think will be benefit from this? And then we're coming to the close of the paper. So we see small airports, medium airport. That seems the obvious result, right? So if you are a regulator, that's what should happen, right? A small airport will benefit from it. And it seems the natural, a small and medium airport. Unfortunately, let me say that's not the case. So if you see here this picture, we see actually two line, three lines. The small airports are at the bottom. That's what they will pay in absence of interdependence. That's the top airport. That's what they will pay for their own security. And that's the middle level that will set down by the regulator to make everybody happy. But then you see that making everybody happy is actually less, so the yellow on top is the one from the global of the large airport, and it's higher than the small airports. And that's of course obvious if you think for a moment. The more you go to interdependence, the more big airports that are tightly connected are gonna benefit. So what if the regulator tried to balance, what are you gonna say? Well, you know, you're a small airport, you pay more, you do a service to the community. And the big airport, because already generated a lot of money for this, then uh, they will actually benefit from this. And this is like a result that's consistent across all level of interdependence. We came to this result with a simulation by using the actual traffic, like the map, the heat map that I've shown you. But more interesting is what if you have a non-uniform increase, right? So some airport increase their interdependence. So we call gamma, gamma uh, T. Um, and some airports stay unchanged. So they have a 10% interdependence impact. And if you look at the latest airport, we'll see that the, the, from the baseline, the red dots, they will have to have an increase in security expenditure. But for the small airports, this is not clear that there is a gain. Depends on, some of them will spend less money, of course. Others will pay, pay more money because for example, they are tightly interconnected with a big airport. So they are not gonna benefit from a remote and virtual tower, for instance, because they already use it. So they will just spend more for this additional interconnection and so on. So let me go to the conclusion, because I think you're done. Uh, before I go to the conclusion, let me say, if you want to have more information, you can find in the paper that I co-authored also with uh, Professor Williams and Dan on the risk analysis journal that appeared this year. And so let me go to a summary. So the first summary I want to give you is that of course interdependence and personal adversaries is challenging. The model is complicated. In, in, in our case, we have been able to show that under some assumption that closest form is possible. 
But what the closest forms show it as, and we didn't expect that, that the actual type of interconnection is important. Uh, so it means that if you want really to make a conclusion about reality, you need to actually look at the graph as it is and understand that the graph is very, very known uniform structure. Some airports have very few things. Some other airports have very strong connection. They have very strong feeder, like uh, Verona. And Kona is a completely different setup. So there is no one size fit all that you can say it's always going to be like this. Most of the time, the big airport is going to uh, work uh, better. They would be better off out of this. And with this, I think uh, I'm done. So, so thank you very much. And uh, you can answer the question in uh, Mentimeter, or you can ask the question also virtually, uh, I mean, digitally by switching on your mic and Zoom. So thank you very much. OK, I asked the first question then. Uh, I think the, it all seems to be a confirmation of something like the economies of scale. Uh, that large airports can uh, can benefit from whatever whatever happens, basically because they have more passengers. They serve <laughs> larger uh, large, larger audiences, and basically, if the fees are propo uh, that they can charge are proportional to the fees uh, to, to the number of of, of passengers, uh, they are the likely beneficiaries. Yeah, in a, in a sense, this is true. They will uh, uh, because they not only because they have more passengers, but also because they are more tightly interconnected to each other. It's both. Uh -huh. so, so basically, because what happens is essentially, the, remember in the equation, we have the, the, the delta, that's the yeah. matrix that, that multiplied. So this means there are two factors that contribute to it. So on one factor, they have a lot of passengers, okay? But the second thing is they are also a lot interconnected from it. So as soon as one improves the security, all the other, as soon as one big airport improves the security, all the other big, air, big airports are going to benefit from it. Also the small airports, but the small airports, they don't have much traffic to the big airport from, from the, the perspective of the small airport, right? Uh, and so you see that that's why we create the richer get richer because they only talk to themselves or mostly talk to themselves, right? <laughs> and the, the poorer stay still at the fringe. And the more they go at the fringe, they, 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 the more they are asked to contribute money uh, to make the big guys on the top more secure, if you want. Because you see, if there was no this interconnection, uh, the, the small airport will have paid less probably. Uh, and the, at a certain point, we actually made a calculation. We were not really sure. We had to take it off from the paper. That probably from the perspective of the big airport, they are actually making money from security. Uh, in a sense that they, take, they get more security money than they actually need to spend. So does, does the model uh, reveal any, any obvious solution? What would be a reasonably fair distribution of the costs of, of interconnectedness? Um, we tried to explore some, some options. So one option was the idea that you pay by flight, not by passengers. Uh, but uh, that's, that will have created the different uh, political problems. It's a lot easier for people to transfer the cost from the passengers. Um, the, the also the centralized solution is um, the, the everybody pays and the government pays the money. It's, it's not going to be feasible uh, politically. Uh, and the, so the only things that when we discuss this with Air, airport uh, <coughs> control, uh, airport um, council international was presented by the uh, industry partner that we have to airport council Europe. And they said, oh, we know that. Even though now we have a mathematical proof that is true, but we knew that. And we did, we are always arguing that there should be less strict um, security rules for, for small airports. Uh, that was their, their argument. So there should be different levels um, 
from the perspective of, of airports. That, that's what is a solution. So the different airports may be asked to, to give a different security perspective uh, because, but this assume, this was the assumption uh, that for us is not really true that the, the attackers will also discriminate between airports. And so now we don't make the assum this assumption. We don't make any assumption that a, a bigger airport is a preferred target than a larger airport. We don't make this any assumption in this respect. But that, that, that would not even be realistic because, you know, if I want to smuggle a bomb uh, to a large intercontinental flight, I might smuggle it on, on a small airport to a small flight that is interconnected and my baggage will travel unchecked after it already entered the international space. Yeah, you know, they, they thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> they thought about that already. Um, and they did one of the reasons of the Pan Am, for instance, traffic, is that yeah. now they make sure that there is, when you're starting with the bomb in a small airport and you get the connecting flight, uh, they make sure that if your baggage is not on the big interconnecting flight, on the big plane, then, uh, so sorry, that if you are not on the big plane, your baggage is not with you. That's true. And indeed, they started also to check again all the baggages that arise from, from the small airports. Because essentially for this, for this reason, that because the regulator are actually realizing that this is a bigger cost for small airport, they're actually more technically lenient with the smaller airports. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, but I would be happy to reserve this. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's but basically this is something which is kind of a general challenge in this type of research, because you have the computational models, but you also argue that you can get closed formula occasionally under specific circumstances. Uh, now, here is my question. These models are good enough to make predictions that can be tested, but whether they really offer explanations. Now, this is a good question. I, I like that. Um, so now the thing is that I've learned interacting with the industry and so on. Uh, you do not expect to have point-wise prediction. Okay. Uh, because also there are lots of things that can happen, right? Because we are too abstract. But you would like to give them, or they would like to have, what I say, the sign of the derivative. Yeah. Okay. So they don't, they don't really want, they don't really care that this is five euros or seven euros or 7.6 euros. They would like to know, okay, if we are doing this, this is going to be worse or better? Uh, sure. And how because much better? At least this, it gives an indication of uh, things, uh, things that are changing, right? And they also have certain things that are difficult to monetize. So let me make an example that I have from interacting with the company and, and risk. So among the risk metrics that they have, they also have a sort of something, a stepwise function. Besides euros and so on, they also have jail years. And the, because depending on what happens, if certain things exceed the threshold, uh, the, the CEO of the company will go in jail. <laughs> and uh, up to three years, that's okay, because you in most of the European countries, uh, you get stay out of jail, right? They give you, I don't know, home arrest. After three years, that's bad because you actually have to serve in jail. And so from their perspective, it's not really important that it is 2.5 years in jail or two years in jail, right? The lawyers can get out of it. Uh, is that whether it's too much, is, is actually serving years in jail or not. So that from their perspective, once you have this idea, okay, we deploy the security solution, and we get we maybe have chances to get hacked, but that's still low. This is too high. You're gonna end in the newspaper, and probably you will have to serve years in jail. That's bad. 
then all other things are second order because lots of other things can happen. So that, that's, I don't know if this is an answer for your perspective, but in this case, the, it says the, the, the magnitude is important. The, the derivative is important. The individual value is less important. Thank you very much indeed. I think we passed our available slot. Uh, so from now on, the risk that we can have to go to jail is increasing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so thank you for having me. By the way. Thank you very much again. I think it was uh, really very insightful and, uh, you know, especially in the context of, of air travel and the difficulties with it, because, okay, bomb are, are rare. I mean, they happen, but they are rare. However, uh, I think coronavirus travels kind of undetected and <laughs> kills a lot more people uh, than bombs these days. Right, uh, right. This is a good paper to, to spin out of this idea. <laughs> I think it would be an interesting, interesting area of application uh, to figure out who should test and on what level the, the passengers on airlines. Yeah, definitely. I think this is a good suggestion from a future paper. Okay, I'm very much interested to think, think it through. So, see you soon. See you soon. Uh, thank Bye. you very much indeed. Thank you very Bye. much.